Hello, Gregory, David, and Paul. It's so nice to have you here virtually over Zoom. It's nice to have all three of you members of the Zyber Trio here in our classic 107 Zoom studio, I guess you'd call it. Nice to be here. Mm -hmm. um, Gregory, maybe I thought I'd ask you this question. Can you first t start by telling us how the group formed and how you came about with the name the Zyber Trio? Sure, yeah, so our group goes back to about 2014, which was the first year that all three of us lived in Winnipeg. And at that point, I was playing with Paul in a duo, violin piano duo. David had started performing and recording with Paul as a cello piano duo. David and I were in a quartet together at U of M for three years. So between the three of us, we were performing together in various capacities for several years, but never actually as an ensemble, the three of us together. And so I think it was maybe around 2019, we started having a conversation, like it would be great for the three of us to finally as a trio do something together. And so we put together a chamber music concert and actually our first one involved a violist as well to be a piano quartet. But that was kind of our first outing as the three of us all together in a concert playing chamber music. And so from there, the Women's Musical Club, um, we were in contact with them and arranged to do a concert with them. And that was our official first concert full program as a trio, the three of us together. So it's really been fun watching the ensemble evolve over time and kind of all the pieces come together. Mm -hmm. and maybe, I think it was David who found our trio name or Paul. Um, I forget which one it was, but they could tell you a bit more about the name. Either one of you jump in. I'm curious, where does this name Zyber come from? Um, well, it was uh, just a simple Google search. Honestly, I was I was looking at <laughs> I think baby names. <laughs> um, wow! This this one means um, coming of dawn, uh, uh, blo blossoming and coming of dawn. I think uh, in Arabic or something like that. So uh, I think I think it sounds cool. I don't know anything starting with Z and Y is, catches my interest. Absolutely. That sounds great. Um, I understand that all three of you have been doing uh, your studying studies outside of Manitoba at various uh, schools. Can you tell us what it's what it's been like for you during COVID in regards to uh, your music education? Like, how has that been working for all, all three of you? Maybe we'll just go sort of go around the Zoom room, as it were. And maybe I'll start with Paul. What's it been like for you? Sure. Well, um, so I'm studying at Colburn right now. I was a uh, when COVID started in March. I I was a master's student then, and then that was my second year master's. So I graduated online, and then started <laughs> artist diploma online. <laughs> wow. So I'm a first year artist diploma. Yeah, it's been good. My teacher's uh, he's really good at online lessons. So you know, still I'm still enjoying the process for sure. So and then Zoom lessons. Yeah, pretty much. And then they're planning on opening up back to back in the fall. So we'll be going back there to LA. So looking forward nice. to that. Uh, David, what about you? What's been um, Yeah, um, I'm, I'm also, I've been online since last March. Um, so it's been over a year. And um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's okay though. My school, my school is also very small, the Glenn Gould School in Toronto. Uh, it's about the same size as Colburn, um, where Greg and Paul go. Um, and they've just been very, both schools, I think I've been very supportive of the students and have, have um, made it really easy to do everything online. So I, I can't complain. Good teachers. Mm. And so I'm just sort of curious about like uh, academic courses, your theories and histories and whatnot. Is that, has that just been all online online courses as well? Oh yeah, so my school kind of had a hybrid model um, where uh, when they could have things in person, they did um, like private lessons and like chamber music, stuff like that. Um, but they just gave everyone the option to not come to Toronto if they if people weren't from Toronto. So that's just what I did because uh, it was the safest, safest option. But um, yeah, everything for me has been online. Mm. And Gregory, has it been the same for you? Yeah, so I also attend the Colburn School in Los Angeles, and I don't mean to be downer about the experience, but I got to do six months at the school, and then we went online in March, and I'll be graduating this coming May. So I got my six-month experience, and then about a year and three months of the degree I did online. Oh, wow. But I really got to say that my teacher and the school has done an amazing job throughout the entire pandemic, converting like chamber music and orchestra classes into excerpt classes that we can do online 
still coaching with people from Los Angeles Philharmonic and the Colburn School to complete those classes and really make them a meaningful experience. And my teacher has just been so supportive throughout online lessons this whole time. So I really feel that I've continued growing and learning throughout studying over Zoom as much as that seems like it wouldn't be an option for musicians. It's really worked out in the end. Mm -hmm. So like I say, you've been studying outside of the province. Can you talk us through the whole self-isolation thing and how that whole thing came about to get the three of you able to perform together in the same room? How did, how did that work? Sure. So <laughs> Paul and David are both in Winnipeg right now. They have been for, I think, both of them almost the entire pandemic. They've been in Winnipeg, but I'm in Ontario with my family. Okay. So what that looked like was I considered flying, but we decided that, you know, things shift so quickly and, you know, from one week to the next, suddenly cases could explode. So we didn't want me to be dependent on flying back from Winnipeg should something happen. So I drove to Winnipeg and got an apartment and bunkered down for two weeks, read some books, watched more TV than I'd like to admit. And after that, then I moved in with David's family and we rehearsed at David's house for the two okay. weeks leading up to recording. Okay. Sounds great. Okay, so let's talk about the concert that is going to be available as of April the 26th. Uh, you're going to be performing music of Beethoven, Joan Tower, Shostakovich, and Ravel. So we've got three 20th century composers and one uh, composer who wrote his music late 18th century. Um, I have to ask a question of all three of you. Is there any Thing that you have to mentally change in your mind in regarding in regards to switching gears from playing the music of Beethoven to perhaps playing the music of Joan Tower, like mentally on your instruments, do you have to do you have to switch gears at all? Greg, do you want to maybe talk talk to that? Sure. Um, the one thing I really noticed switching between Beethoven and twentieth century composers is that with Beethoven you have such a clear style beginning to end, like. We've played other works by Beethoven. We're used to that style. You know, there's usually predictable phrasing, like formal things that you can, you know, we have now arrived at the development of this movement. Whereas Joan Tower, the piece is very much broken up into like different character pieces. Um, so it keeps you on your toes when you're playing 20th century music. You have to be ready to completely switch gears into a new sound or a new extended technique that you're going to carry through with for the next minute or so. So, yeah, you can't rely on prior experience in the same way when you're playing 20th century music as yeah. you can with approaching Beethoven. Yeah, and sort of, it's, I'm thinking as a pianist, Paul, I mean, playing Beethoven is much different than perhaps playing the bigger, bigger, meatier parts of the Shostakovich trio and even the Ravel trio. There's some pretty uh, large uh, moments in that. Do you have to change the way you're, you're playing the piano when you, no. when you approach the works? Yeah, definitely. Um... I think like Beethoven is so intuitive for so many of us because we we've all played like a ton of Beethoven, you know. But something like uh, Shostakovich, Tower, Ravel, less less so, you know. And the music, the particular of the Ravel, the music is just more challenging. It was is the hardest piece on the program to put together for sure. Not only as an ensemble, but individually, technically as well for all three of us. So I mean that that was um, it, we we planned on programming it actually because there's, there's not very many chances in your lifetime where you can like really spend like two weeks working on a difficult work like this. So we thought this would be a really good opportunity for that. And it has been so. Mm -hmm. Fun. Uh, I have to ask about the Beethoven. Okay, we were talking about this uh, before I press the record button. I'm a clarinet player myself. Uh, so the, the Beethoven trio is of particular interest to me. You know, you think of piano trios, the first Beethoven trios that popped to my mind are perhaps uh, the Archduke trio or um, the Ghost trio or maybe even the Cockadoo variations. Why this trio? What, what is it about this piece that you, that you found so, so interesting? Uh, I, it's my favorite trio personally, uh, by okay. Beethoven, uh, for, for, yeah, for piano trio. Um, I played it, I played the first movement with clarinet years ago and I just, I, I just loved it. So, um, yeah, any opportunity that I get to play it, I would say I would, I would definitely take that opportunity. Um, but yeah, we were looking at Beethoven trios because of the, uh, it's the two two hundred fiftieth anniversary, right? Two hundredth. Yeah, I two, know two, this. Yeah, Beethoven two fifty was uh, last year. Yeah. Yeah, in twenty twenty, and this kind of being postponed indefinitely 
through 2021. So we kind of felt that it was uh, definitely important to uh, program some Beethoven and um, yeah. It, and, and this is also written for uh, violin and a piano and cello as well. So we thought it would work. Mm -hmm. So David, was it your choice to uh, pick this open opus 11 uh, trio? Oh, I think it was unanimous. I think we were all kind of like, oh yeah, this is, mm -hmm. this is, this is the one. Mm -hmm. And it has that just great set of variations on a this sort of folksy theme in, in the in the final movement. It's it's a it's a great piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great movement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about the Joan Tower. Um, Joan Tower is so well known for creating all these wonderful uh, soundscapes uh, with her music. Uh, can you talk about this piece, uh, Big Sky? Um, Paul, maybe I'll, I'll I'll turn it over to you. How, sure. What is it? What is this piece, and how did it how did it come about, and how did the trio discover it? So um, we really wanted to program something by a living composer, by a contemporary composer. So we were doing some looking and um, came across. I, I wasn't really aware of Joan Tower's chamber music, honestly. I, I knew her piano concerto and some other works, but then you know, I was googling like piano trios and stuff. And I uh, found uh, Trio Cavani, which is a piece that she wrote, I think, after this one. She wrote in 2007 or 2009, if I remember. But it, it, was, it was about 20 minutes. And um, I thought it'd be a little difficult for the, for the rehearsal time we had, you know, and given that um, we had other stuff on the program to prepare. So uh, I was doing some more research and I found this piece that she wrote. It was about seven minutes and listened to it. It's like, oh, this is a great piece, you know. And she wrote it in, um, she wrote it. Uh, it was com complimentary to another piano trio she wrote. Mm -hmm. I am, I'm, not, I'm blanking on the name, but um, uh, there, there are two pieces that are meant to go together. There, she, she is fond of a uh, horseback riding, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when she was younger, and it's just supposed to reflect the, uh, the kind of the vast properties of the landscape and her enjoyment of, you know, her youthful horseback riding, um, just hobby. So, um, she actually. Yeah, she grew up in Bolivia, I think, uh, in La Paz. Oh, and I didn't know so, that. Yeah, yeah, so she she, uh, she wrote um, in this piece, and I think in a lot of her pieces, um, that uh, she was just very inspired by the, the landscape of the Andes. And um, yeah, just the incredibly, yeah, incredible landscape um, and, so, and horseback riding. So the title Big Sky makes sense, uh, obviously, from, from, that, from that standpoint. Um, I have to ask, uh, I made reference to this before. Does she do any extended techniques for any of the three instruments in, in this piece? I'm just, and, and if she does, what are they? Paul, you're shaking your head. She doesn't. No, it's all pretty conventional, actually. I mean, the soundscape is, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's large and, um, it's very, uh, horizontal, you could say. Like there's like, there's definitely a uh, different sonic spaces throughout the piece. But um, there's no like, you know, plucking the inside of the piano or anything. Right, like that, right, so. right, right, right. It's quite conventional in that capacity. Mm. Yeah, she plays with range and sound a lot. Not necessarily through extended techniques, but she'll have like the cello way up here and the violin like really soft at the opposite end of the range and piano doing something like incredibly virtuosic, but almost unheard in the middle kind of thing. So lots of unconventional uses of the instruments to create new worlds kind of in that way. Right. And also range in terms of pitch too, like very high violin sounds, very high piano sounds, like in the stratosphere. And then you have that contrasted with um, like the very low sounds uh, of the cello and piano as well. So mm. it sounds, sounds really, really interesting. I mean, it's going to be great to hear it on, on the 26th. Um, it actually, in some way, you were talking about these, these sections that are, are created in the piece that actually, uh, makes a nice turn to the next piece that you're going to play in the program. You're going to be doing Shostakovich's first piano trio. And one of the things that I find so striking about that first piano trio is that there's these sections where it's outright romanticism. It's pure D romanticism. And then there's other uh, points in the, in the trio where the music couldn't come from any, anybody else, but Shostakovich. Um, it's in it's in one one movement. What is it about this piece that you found so fascinating? I think for me, I I just um, I haven't played that much Shostakovich yet, and uh, I think the Shostakovich that I have played, his works that I have played, are mostly um, from his later period, and so they're 
they're mostly uh, darker. Um, but I was really attracted to this piece because it is so uh, early. It's Opus 8, and he wrote it when he was 16 or 17. Yeah, he was still a student, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's incredibly youthful. And I think what you mentioned about the romanticism is totally true, and it's kind of what draw me, uh, drew me to the piece. Um, there's just some incredibly beautiful themes and melodies, at, uh, especially at the beginning of the piece. And uh, yeah, I think everyone will love it. Um, some great cello solos. It's always good. <laughs> Spoke, spoken from the, from the cellist. Uh, <laughs> Greg and Paul, what do you like about the piece? Well, you know, um, it's kind of like David said, it's just, it's, uh, it's youthful in a sense. You know, it's not like some of the later works of Shostakovich, it's just, it can be like, <laughs> they're, they're amazing pieces, but it's like 20, 25 minutes of just like, oppression you know yeah so this, this this piece there's a little more um vitality to it you could say and um yeah just uh there's this particularly lovely theme that the cello introduces quite early on and then we each take turns working through it and it's just such a a foil to the other themes in the work and just what you typically think of when you think of Shostakovich you know it's just this unbelievable but beautiful and um just almost innocent kind of innocent kind of melody that you don't usually get. So mm -hmm. it's just it's a lovely piece. And it's it's interesting. It's only it's written in one single movement, right? Like yeah. it's like it's just this sort of one what 14, 15 minute long single movement uh, you know work that is just uh, has all these different characters to it. It's a it's a stunner of a piece. Yeah, it goes it goes through a lot. <laughs> yeah. In that uh, in it's it's yeah. it's it's quite a world. It's I mean he he goes through a lot of worlds in that just that short little time frame. And that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the last piece on on the program is the Ravel, and uh, you made mention of it. Uh, all three of you made mention of it earlier. I'm going go to go sort of go around the the room. Uh, Paul, what is it for you as uh, the pianist that you find so fascinating about playing the Ravel trio? It's just such a masterwork of the 20th century piano trio literature, right? Oh, it's it's one of the greats. Uh, I mean, texturally, it's very different from a lot of piano trios. Um, balance is a big issue with it. So, um, you know, the way he treats the piano, like piano is ultimately a percussion instrument, right? And I, I think in Ravel's writing, um, it's he tries to accentuate that a little bit. So if you hear in like the second movement, the, you know, the piano has very um, kind of articulated presence. And it, it also in the third movement, like the treatment of the chorale in the piano is just very ideal to the instrument, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, just a fun piece to play. <laughs> nice. David, how about, how about you? What is it about the, the trio that you enjoy so much? Yeah, well, I think typical of Ravel uh, and and French composers in the early twentieth century, it's very atmospheric, and there's there's he uses a lot of techniques in the strings, especially like uh, harmonics, artificial harmonics, mm -hmm. and very fast uh, notes, bow strokes um, that just create like a, a soundscape that's very um, ephemeral and like, yeah, not really tangible. And, and, um, it's just, yeah, incredibly beautiful. Um, the second movement is very fun to listen to and to play. Um, it's, it's, it's a, a lot like the second movement of his string quartet, actually. Right. Um, it's just very, a lot of character and very uh, rhythmic. And the third movement, I think, um, it was so much fun to record, actually. Um, I, I feel like, uh, yeah, I, I felt really good about our performance <laughs> of that movement in particular. It was, it was, uh, it's just such a deep, heartfelt movement, um, almost similar to the Shostakovich uh, in a way. It's like, it's very brooding and um, it's, it, it really contrasts with the second movement really well. Um, yeah. That sounds great. And Gregory, what about you? What is it about the Ravel? Yeah, I, I mean, I just admire his writing so much. Like he achieves a 
bigger world of colors in this piano trio than I think any other composer ever has within a piano trio, like through his use of extended techniques and register and dynamics, just the combinations are mind blowing that he pulls out. And the melodies are just so gorgeous. And so many of them, they just soar and they go on and on. And yeah, it's just such a pleasure to play and listen to, I think. And it's just such a joy to finally work on this huge piece because it's one of those bucket list pieces that like, when will we have enough time to rehearse the Ravel Trio? Well, the middle of a pandemic is <laughs> right, right, right. we'll have enough time to rehearse the Ravel Trio. So yeah, Perfect. it was really enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, it's, it's one of the things that for me personally, I love about Ravel's music as you were talking about, it's just all these wonderful textures and colors. And uh, you were talking, David, about the Ravel quartet. It's this piano trio is very much the same type of thing. It's all these wonderful sounds and textures that Ravel writes for with all the harmonics and whatnot. It's, it's just mm -hmm. a fantastic trio. It sounds like it's going to be a great concert uh, on, on the 26th. Uh, do you know how long the uh, video is going to be available for for download have you heard from the women's musical club about when the video uh, like how long you, people will be able to view the video i think for quite a long time uh, i i don't think uh, uh people need to worry about necessarily watching it on the day it releases um although it will be a good time uh you should come uh we'll have a live chat on 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 the women's musical club's uh, youtube channel um, but it will be up for quite a while. I, I don't think we have a set time that's going to be up, but. And the, and the price is right because the price is. Absolutely free. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, Incredible. a free concert to see Shostakovich trio, Ravel trio, Beethoven trio, and Joan Tower. Like it's, it's going to be just a fantastic, fantastic concert. Uh, I'll wrap, I'll wrap things up this way. What's next for all three of you? Or is it just back to school uh type thing like once this this thing comes out on the 26th paul what are you what are you going to do, be doing um well uh so right now um i will be at, i will be attending the aspen festival this summer so um just uh figuring out the logistics of that for now and then that'll be eight weeks in uh um aspen colorado so nice looking forward to some beautiful mountains you know mm -hmm. <laughs> Just bring a tank of uh, air with you because the altitude, the altitude is, uh, can, is, is interesting. Uh, right. David, how about you? What are you going to be doing? Um, I'm doing uh, the National Youth Orchestra um, online program this summer. Really? Uh, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, and then hopefully going back to Toronto for my last year of my degree in the fall. But right. I mean, I'm not going to jinx anything. So... Uh, <laughs> This is this is a tangent. How is NYO gonna gonna work it this year? Is it just gonna be a, a sort of virtual thing with with teachers, or how's that gonna work? Uh, yeah. So this is the uh, second summer that they've uh, that they've done an online program. Um, there's there's a bunch of seminars uh, with um, uh, faculty and staff talking about a variety of subjects. Um, so there's yeah lots of kind of educational opportunities that are not really. Um, necessarily like playing, um, uh, like performance related, um, but more like ideas behind performing. Uh, and then we get lessons. So cool. Yeah. Excellent. And, and Gregory, what about you? What's up? Yeah, I'll be spending two months at the Norfolk Chamber Music Festival in Norfolk, Connecticut. So we'll show up the first week and all quarantine and do our tests and then for the remainder of the summer actually we'll be our own bubble there's 20 of us that are going to play string quartets all summer oh and wow just can't leave the campus no audience members but we have the opportunity to work together in our own tiny community and do lots of live stream concerts and recorded concerts all summer so i'm really excited for that and then afterwards i'll be starting my doctor of musical arts degree at yale university nice. so sounds great David, Gregory, and Paul, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me today. It's just been a, a, a real treat. This concert on the 26th sound, sounds like it's just going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal thing to see. And the price is right, completely free. And you don't even have to leave your, your house. You can just watch uh, these three young Manitoba musicians perform all this wonderful music. Guys, thanks again. Thanks for taking, taking the time to chat with me. Thank you thanks so much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.